people want to go to these events because there were, they went over 10K in the final year again. Um, and maybe the other conventions, now that BronyCon is gone, will get a little bump in attendance because a lot of people might only be able to afford to go to one convention a year. And they're going to choose the last BronyCon, right? If that's the final one. But now that that's over, might see a bump elsewhere. Show is ending, how will that affect things? Then COVID comes in and it's like, we have no idea what's going to happen. And we started seeing cons having to cancel, unfortunately, yep. just with the state of the world at that time. And we're very fortunate that we're able to come back at this point. Yeah. So as some of you guys might know, if you guys, again, we talk about the furries a bit. The furries are very tech savvy. The joke is a, a plane full of furries go heading to a convention is dangerous because as that plane crashes, there goes the entire American IT. Yeah, <laughs> all of the IT so while people joke that, you know, furries are very tech savvy, they are still a generation older than the Brony fandom. So of course, the most modern, up-to-date tech savvy people will be the Bronies. And it made sense that when the pandemic happened, the first online cons came from the Brony fandom. And it made sense because years, even before the concept of online cons were really a thing, the Brony fandom was already doing a lot of fun cons for fun. Um, so for example, from the Tumblr Pond area, you guys might know Horses at Home Con, an online convention, kind of a little fun, little jokey uh, online convention. I even did my own Chapel Con. Oh, concept. Yeah, I did my own Chapel Con where I basically did three days of live stream, uh, live streaming to online stores, panels, um, through these websites that no longer exist anymore. And we already had the concept of jokey cons. You had uh, Friends Con, done by Midnight Premiere, you have Karate Con West, done by our friend Sheer. So the idea of having these jokey cons and online cons are already a thing. So it made sense, within weeks of the pandemic happening, uh, one of my friends, an uh, artist named Ruth, she basically created a Discord group um, to help a lot of this place dealers, and we basically made a virtual dealers hall on Discord. From there, uh, one of our friends, Catherine, picked up the idea and basically decided, okay, not just the dealers hall, let's also have these live stream panels and events. Yeah. Basically got Ponyville. Yeah, Pony 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 but also Dex. Dex. Dex as well, our friend Dex. Dex is kind of the one who coordinated everything from the beginning. Uh, like, who, who knows Pony Fest? Yes. Watch Pony Fest. Strings, done Pony Fest. Yeah, so that whole thing came together for the very first time in one week. I'm not even kidding. It was, it was literally, everything was just shutting down. And I think I got a DM from Dex saying like, hey, do you want to help? We're trying to do like something to, you know, help people stay positive during the event. There's vendors that have now lost a big source of income. Um, so what can we do to kind of keep things afloat during COVID when we can't come and meet in person? So um, I did events for Pony Fest for like the first five events. Um, but that first one came together in a week, and yeah, it's thanks to Dex, it's thanks to Catherine, who basically built from scratch the entire streaming infrastructure. Um, folks like Larsis, who I think is still on the back, there's just so many, so many incredible people that uh, uh, put a lot of work into making Ponyfest happen, and it was a lot of work, uh, but it seems that it accomplished its mission, which is something OnlyFest set the template for a lot of yeah. online cons afterwards. So BabsCon went online, and a lot of these other trot con went online. Generally using the PonyFest system, system, like system literally and using yeah. a software that was developed for PonyFest. And so it made sense that the BronyCons kind of came online first, and then of course quickly your brother and the furries followed. Uh, and we could see kind of a step-to-step -step of where everything went, because uh, the PonyCon started to introduce things like uh, Pony, the PonyTap and PonyPill. Ponytown, so yeah, so Ponytown, that's the, the one you see there in the bottom with all the little pixelated ponies. It's you like make a girl custom avatar and interact with the world, and we actually live stream panels. And yes, kind of which, which the Ponytown people worked with us to, you know, incorporate those two things together and figure out how do you make a video stream go into this. And it, it was the very first time we did that, and went in there, I was, it was mind blowing. I'm like, this is amazing. Uh, there were other interesting solutions to the same problem to give it more of a feeling like a space because that's kind of what was maybe missing originally is that for an online thing it's just you sitting on your computer and you you, you feel connected to people but you don't have the sense of being in a shared space so much. So Pony Town, that integration was a way to address that. Also really interesting, unique solutions was uh, uh, SEA PonyCon, Southeast Asia Southeast Pony Con, Asia. used Minecraft. Yeah. They built a convention center in Minecraft and had all these mods that let them put in custom textures for a vendor hall and import live streams into an actual screen and a theater. 
um, which was very interesting. Of course, we see uh, the furries, of course, after that had to take the ball, and then the furries basically recreated the convention centers within Second Life and VR, and of yeah. course, you know, furries, they were already were fursuits. And so, of course, moving to online avatars really made sense, but we can kind of see this natural line of Brody doing all the kinds and furries basically having to one-up us. And it shows how powerful and how well-run uh, the furry Brody cons are, because when we think of conventions, we think of the big cons, the comic cons, and the anime cons, and the sci-fi cons, and we rarely think of the furry and the uh, Brody cons. But when everything had to shift online, you can see how solid, how strong, foundation for uh, Brony and Furry con running was that they were able to take the ball and not just make online conventions first, but make fantastic, well-worn, well-polished um, online conventions where when Comic-Con and the anime cons started to shift online, they completely failed. They had to source it out to people and yeah. live streams and recorded <laughs> stuff. Very laggy. <laughs> they were not prepared. Hey, look, it's us. Yeah. You guys. Yes, I think so. But I think that concludes definitely the history portion of the panel because we we are we are still here. The pandemic happened, yeah. Bronicon's over, Gen 4 is over, but we are still here. And I think we're gonna start off with a little bit because we have about uh, 20 minutes left, so we're gonna talk a little bit about the future. And then we're gonna start allowing you guys to line up so you could kind of take questions, but because we're probably running short on time, please no long comments. Uh, just a quick short question and you guys can start lining up uh, and we'll take questions and as you do we're going to just talk about in the future because Everfree right now is currently the largest pony con in existence um you were con chair for the pivotal years of Everfree coming back after so you basically had to take the reins of being the con chair for two years for what's now the largest pony con that's in the shadow of the former pony con no longer existing. Yeah, well, I mean, there were many interesting challenges just coming into that role already, and then COVID on top of things really threw it. I mean, I was like very despondent generally, like at the beginning when I realized like that this actually might not happen. Like we might have to actually cancel the event for the first time. So that was very stressful having to deal with that. And, but the thing is, there was a sort of shared stress too, because it was like, well, everyone is dealing with this. Uh, people are getting furloughed, um, regular events are closing, you can't go to the grocery store anymore, right? There were all these different things happening, but on that angle, there was a huge uncertainty. Like, when we do come back, will the interest still be there? Will not having this stuff for a year be enough to like kill the momentum that we still had coming off of the final BronyCon. Because again, BronyCon ending felt like it, it reinvigorated things to a certain degree, because it suddenly it, there's this massive, massive, massive event that shows you, yes, there is still all this energy in the fandom. Then COVID happens and it's like, all that momentum that we were hoping would carry forward, who knows where that's gonna go, you know? And it's, it's still, I mean, Projecting, if COVID hadn't happened, projecting our attendance in 2020, it would have been considerably higher. It probably would have been a record year. Um, so coming back from COVID is, is very interesting, but it's been a, a, a very interesting experience. It's still the attendance for Everfree is impressive. Um, if we think about, again, furries like to say there are larger conventions than that. At current moment, furry cons are still larger than pony cons on average, but Everfree here in the Pacific Northwest still dwarfs a lot of these uh, local, smaller uh, furry conventions, so it's just impressive how strong, even with the numbers dip, Everfree was still able to gain such a sizable audience. And one thing that we can credit there is, is that, and this is true before COVID as well, um, Everfree has always had a very high priority goal of being a 100% family friendly event kind of in that middle, middling period, like 2015 to 2018, when generally a lot of the pony cons were seeing a decline in attendance. Everfree actually either sort of kept growing a little bit and then plateaued and then didn't see as much shrink as a lot of the other pony conventions. And we credit that heavily to uh, families with kids, essentially. We've been able to uh, do our marketing in such a way to let the local community know uh, local families that want to come in and, and just have a fun weekend with their kids. Um, and so that's always been a high priority for us and will continue to be so. We've had comments like uh, from parents saying that their kid, if given the choice, would choose Everfree over Disney World. Yes. So 
That that kind of comes. I, I, again, I, I've been doing the con history for many years, and I, I don't want to pick favorites or biases with like these different conventions I cover. But specifically, the Brony fandom itself, I I, I find it so because I think there's a stereotype that Bronies or older fans are pushing out kids uh, in the in a show that's specifically meant for them. But you look at any con, that's that's really false because. Not just Everfree, but BabsCon and all these other phony conventions have specific areas just for kids, paneling tracks just for kids, arts and crafts. And you see how well integrated uh, these, these younger fans are with um, even the older audiences and how great vendors and cosplayers interact with kids. And it's weird because when we look at like the anime or the furry communities, for example, there's, a, there's an idea where, okay, you have the more adult side, the LGBT queer side, and then that does not mesh with the family-friendly nature. But we look at the cons. We have open expression of inclusivity, of queerness. We have, like I said, all these con chairs and founders are in this, and we can still introduce these inclusivities with a younger audience. And I think it's great, and it kind of defeats this myth that, no, these can't melt. The Brody fandom is doing it perfectly well together. And I don't know why my panel well, we're bringing the screen. All right. Back. But on that note, maybe we can. Yeah, let's let's, let's 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 take some questions. You guys have been great. Uh, start lining up if you have any questions for us. Um, try to keep it short. We have about 50 minutes left. Um, but yeah, we we appreciate you guys sticking through our ramblings. Yes, thank you very much for coming. Hey, hello. Uh, I was curious. You talked about the uh, um, clamp down on the Harry Potter cons. How do you feel that affected um, the part and the community side of it? Because for me, I really view it as, in the pony sense, all of this is intertwined, and they help regenerate each other. The cons help regenerate the art. Oh, and just so forth. So, and you're asking how, how that factors into the Harry Potter fandom, is that right? Yeah, that's, I'm just kind of curious. Okay, I, I'm, not, I'm not super familiar with the Harry Potter fandom. I haven't really considered myself part of it, but this is sort of where you draw the distinction between, like, being a fan of something versus being in the fandom for something don't necessarily those aren't necessarily the same thing, and it's because what a fandom really is is a community, right? And now this is a good segue into the thing that I try to get into this panel every time, uh, which is a little anecdote about um, however many years ago it was. Any Doctor Who fans in here? Good. Uh, however many years it was ago that Peter Capaldi took over, I was watching on the BBC, um, the sort of premiere thing when they were announcing him as the next Doctor. Yeah, and, and uh, I remember very specifically something he said, which, uh, you know, just to paraphrase, was that um, it's the fans that made Doctor Who. It's, it's, it's we made Doctor Who. Everyone made Doctor Who, we all made Doctor Who. And really, the spirit of what he was saying, that really stuck with me, and it still sticks with me, because in essence, what he's, Pointing to is the fact that media, when it's able to engage with an audience such that the audience feels not only like, it, it's, it, that it's not a one-way road, it's not that you're simply consuming something, but that you're reciprocating, you're creating something new, you're giving back to it. That, I feel, is the really defining thing about fandom. It's about community built around reciprocating creativity. It's about a community that comes together. Um, so I don't know much about the Harry Potter fandom. I, I'm sure to a certain degree, um, they probably have had you know, that similar sense of community. But with conventions kind of going away, it means that a lot of it has to stay kind of online. And we're lucky to live in an era where the internet is there and allows fans to connect in that way. But I imagine it probably, I mean, would you say that without pony cons, if they just all went away, do you, would you think that the fandom here would just... I, 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 I do definitely think it's different because like I was saying, I was, I'm also tracking Doctor Who cons and Harry Potter cons. Harry Potter cons right now, if you guys... Again, if, I, I'm not a fan of Harry Potter at all. If you guys have been to my past panels, I've been critical of her sloppy writing and world building. But that same argument is going on with, the, with her fandom right now because she has come up as a turf recently. So the fandom would normally 
would debate these type of things at convention panels, but now that is congregated online specifically within the Twitterverse and all this stuff, you can see very big factions of the Harry Potter fandom splitting and doing these civil wars, and there is less development of new creative aspects. Like even now, we can see creative like throwing music videos and fan fiction and fan art that's being displayed and presented at conventions. You have people like Fiora and Sabres who are coming to conventions, releasing new videos, updates, and stuff. And you really don't get that now when Harry Potter is kind of gone or the, the, the convention scene is gone. SpongeBob. See, doesn't really have Harry Potter, so it has to be all done online, which addresses, which includes a very different audience than I would say in-person conventions do. Yeah. Does that hopefully answer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Next question. Thank you. Thanks for buying one of my shirts. I see. <laughs> yeah. Um, as someone who is very new to the fandom, like I only started to interact with people in last March. What is uh, like some sort of media or like creator that I should go out and look for? Whether it be like fan fiction, music, and artists and stuff like that. Um, that's a really good question. I you could ask. You could ask anyone here and get a million different answers on that, Fair. for sure. Yeah, Brody's React is a big thing. Um, I guess the old school stuff, I really like French Prince Witchcraft. It's oh yeah. It's classic, but a lot of memes. So good. Like French Prince Witchcraft, a lot of great music. From um, if you like fan fiction, kind of the biggest fan fiction is actually a crossover with Fallout. It's called Fallout Equestria. So I don't know if you're into that at all, but I know that's a big thing that a lot of people like to talk about. It seems to have its own kind of sub-fandom just around that universe. Um, yeah, I, I mean, my little dashy is a big one. I love the dashy. Yeah, it's a little big, darker. Yeah, 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 maybe not that much. <laughs> <laughs> um, just look at. I would say look at the eight early day, the heyday, the, the the art that got basically these conventions started, like the Peronia Bridge series, uh, French Prince Witchcraft. Even uh, Hot Hot Ticket Demon's a little bit controversial now, but his Apple Dot move was that was very influential too. Influential of a lot of these early memes and stuff. Is that the first time? Pixel Kitties is an artist I would also look at. She basically does a lot of official artwork now, but she does all the autograph art for a lot of conventions now. And she basically solidified making use of the show's style but in its own unique creative touch. You can see it's a Pixel Kitty art piece, even though she's still doing it in show style. Yeah. So, so I, I would also recommend just ask ask more than just us, because yeah, like I said, they're going to get a lot of different answers. But, Good question. And welcome to the fandom. Yeah. Thank you very much. Hi. Um, so say kind of my old pony Gen 5 has like a Star Trek nemesis moment and there's like five years without any official content. What do you think that would do to the fandom? That's a good that's question. That's actually what I was going to bring up before we start doing the Q&As because we've done this panel for a few years now yes. and we always paint the end panel. Gen 5, we don't know what it's going to be, and then last year we were finally like, okay, the movie is yeah, about, the movie's about, about to drop it, but now it is out. That's it. It's just the movie that's out. We don't have a TV show yet, we don't know really much about it, so... Yeah, yeah. yeah, that one special, and the same VAs who were in that special are not even going to be back in the TV show. So we really don't know what the impact of the fandom is, because a lot of us artists, we started drawing G5 artwork in the vendor hall. There's a lot of cosplayers, but still, it's the G4 characters that are recognizable that are being yeah. bought the most and cosplayed the most. And it's still this sort of double whammy where we're, so we're in this interstitial period that you're referencing. Like, we're in the middle of it right now. There is some media, but like, the main stuff I know hasn't come out yet. Um, and But there's still the double whammy of that plus COVID that make it really difficult to see what the long term is going to look like. That said, I think there's plenty of reason to be optimistic. Like. There's so many people here this weekend, if you haven't noticed. I, I was blown away, especially the last two nights, just seeing how active everything was during the evening. Um, it's not all that common these days to go to a convention and see every single room packed at that time of, of day. And I guess everyone was just out of their hotel rooms at the same time or something, and it really shows you there's still a lot of activity and enthusiasm. And I think that's a really good reason to look forward to where we go from here. And like I said in my convention history panel earlier, probably it's, it's not a great comparison to compare the Star Trek cons to the Pony cons because Star Trek honors all these generations and we only go on to the fourth. 
But because we're starting with the fourth, maybe the future generations have the fourth generation. So if we think of G4 as the Star Trek original series in this new timeline, perhaps you know, G5 will be our next generation, and then G6 will be, you know, it yeah. will just continue onward. So there is a potential path for the fandom to take. Yeah, and really, Trekkies are probably the most structurally similar fandom to Bronies in the sense that they're really the only two single IP multi-generational fandoms out there that have a strong commitment. They're the only ones in my con history book that I elevate to the same level as the John Con. But thank you very much for your question. Thank you. Hey, Hi. so um, I'm from the East Coast, and I know a lot of us over there were pretty sad to see Growing Con leave, just as, you know, now there, it feels like there's no local con on the East Coast for a lot of us. Mm -hmm. But um, what do you think is the possibility or the difficulties of a new Growing Con uh, showing up in, this, in these years? So, is there even an attempt in the same state to hear of it? Yeah, that's true. So Sequestria Fest is a relatively new event that just had its first event in Ocean City. Um, but, I mean, to speak more generally, whenever people ask about starting a con, my advice is usually, first, don't. Um, and that's because it's it takes a lot of work, and if you, if you don't go into it, at least probably with a little bit of experience in understanding how these events run, it can cause problems, like we've seen with Unicon or Dashcon or other examples of that kind of thing. Um, I, is your question about like, how, restate your question just so I understand. Um, what like, are you hoping that, what the possibility of an East Coast Con, kind of in a similar vein of what Babs and F3 are re-emerging on the East Coast? Yeah. Um, the issue, that's, that's, that's a tricky one because I always predicted of the Pony Con series to arrive, it would be Pony Con because of the solid IP behind it, specifically Pony Focus. Because I, I always predicted cons like Babs, Everfree, and Trot could naturally transition to become uh, Western animation yes. cons, which never happened. Your big failed and prediction. I, yeah, I, I did. And actually, in fact, I do want to, I actually want to change face and say different things because you said don't start cons. The very same people who I would criticize for, you know, founding a lot of these cons with no experience have created some of the best cons out there. So I'm actually going to change my opinion and say, yeah, don't start cons, but that doesn't mean if you have no experience, you're not going to make something fantastic. Because a lot of people who started these cons were just fresh out of high school, had no experience, probably never even ran a chess club before. And look at all the fantastic cons that they created are now being hired by professional industry people. I would say don't unless you're ready for yes. a whole lot of work and you have a really good network of support from other people who have some experience. Because even things like Everfree, it was a lot of people who were new to it, but we did have quite a bit of support from established conventions in the area. I think, and I think the issue for the East Coast is a lot of the people who are running the Baltimore Con live in the Middle Atlantic, they all moved out here to Seattle now. So that's yeah. why Everfree is so strong because it basically took a lot of steps. For example, I live right now in Orlando. I've been playing around with the idea maybe there should be a Brody Con in Orlando, but there's no solid base there. I would have to fly everyone out, and it's just inconvenient for that. So I don't know, unless it's, I think it has to organically form from at least a meetup at this point, but because the original meetup group that was supposed to be doing the Mid Atlantic Cons were the group that did uh, Maryland DC Bronies who did Clouds of Congress, but once BronyCon moved there, it completely overshadowed them and they were out of the picture. So now that that group is no longer really as active, I'm not sure what the possibility is, maybe in the future, but I think the most accurate thing now is like the old sci-fi cons when a bunch of different genres and fandoms met up. The Pony Cons on the East Coast are essentially the anime and comic cons that have that one meetup or that one panel specifically for Bronies, and I think that's where it will stay in the future until maybe G5 or even Rick Rates here, I think. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much. Thanks. And so, uh, there's something I've kind of noticed, particularly in the last couple of years, I was wondering what your thoughts are, and if it's something you've noticed as well, which is, I mean, I'm, I've been in the fandom since early 2012, so I'm kind of an older Brony, but I've noticed there's almost this new generation of people who were like the target demographic when this show was airing, and they're now like, what makes me feel really old to say, but they're now yeah. adults, and there seems to be online a lot of like, of like Friday Night Funkin' and stuff, all this focus on, you know, a lot of the classic fandom memes and things that people were nostalgic for 
kind of, I guess is what we're full start with that kind of nostalgic feel. Yeah, a lot of old memes being, like, brony memes even being resurrected through TikTok and stuff. Yeah. Like, but I, I love that point you're saying about there's now people that come to these events as fully fledged members of the fan community who were in the target demographic. Who, yeah, like literally, think about it. This convention is 10 years old. The show is like what, 12? Yeah. So, 13. 12 years ago, there were there were children, small children in that demographic who are now adults and are and and it, some of them are even married and have their own kids now. That's how crazy. Uh, that's how long the fandom has been. Weird. Yeah, so it's it's a weird thing to think about. We had someone at our panel last year uh, come up and mention that, like, hi, I was in the target demographic and, and sort of gave some perspectives on what it was like for them. There's certain things where, like, I've always been somewhat concerned about what, like, how the adult fandom impacts the experience of, of, of kids who are watching the show and if there's any negatives to that. I think there probably are some. And so it's about kind of mitigating that. That's always been something that's very important to me. But um, I think it is an interesting phenomenon to see that, like, yes, there are kids that grew up and then realized, oh, there's a whole community around this. And they had a sort of very uniquely immersive experience in that sense, maybe. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Hi, Ben. Hi. Right. First, this is your uh, like two minute. Yeah. Okay. Um, and second, what are your thoughts on the evolution of con mascots over the year, and why is Marina the best one? Ah, good. Two part question. It's actually, funny because I think we have probably the most experience with this. Not only does Everfree have some fantastic mascots, you were a mascot for Brony Con, and I designed mascots for a bunch of content including mascots. So. Yeah, That's an interesting so, perspective there. I always, okay, yeah, so just from my perspective, I know that, um, so BronyCon obviously has their three big mascots, and starting in 2015 is when they started having cosplayers actually play them in person. I was host beats, obviously, and I've always felt that BronyCon had a really, really excellent, um, just what they did with the mascots in terms of engaging with the people at BronyCon was really, really special. That was probably one of the most rewarding things I've gotten to do in this fandom, was you know, play the role of Hoofbeats and just interact with people, because um, there would be so many people that would take me aside and like tell me their life story, or tell me how the fandom saved them, or brought them out of a really dark place, uh, and they would thank me personally for it, <laughs> which I'm like, I, I, I'm just, just here for the director, you were a mascot. No, but it shows that mascots are a way that help people relate and connect more with conventions than maybe otherwise they might be able to. And that's also why I'm, I'm glad that like we've been able to kind of shift more into that BronyCon model of doing things, especially this year with our mascots. We've got some really great people uh, involved in helping with that this year. And I, I am on the same page as you. I do. I am on Team Marina. So. Uh, I, I do also I mean, give a shout out to Babs really. because I think Babs really actually was the pioneers of some of this. Now, in retrospect, there's a lot of controversies because I think Babs overworked a lot of the uh, their uh, in-person cosplayers and mascots, mm -hmm. but they were really interactive. Babs would do skits. They would even basically break into panel rooms and interact with the panelists for a lot of the stuff. Have you ever been to Babs? Uh, maybe in retrospect, it's a little awkward, but they were fun little opening and closing ceremony skits. And for me personally, I, I was actually happy because one of the mascots I designed was Silver Span from Babscon. And I originally knew they were a trans character when I designed them, but back then it would have not been as open to accept a trans character. So finally, years later, I was able to say Silver Span was actually a trans character, and I was happy with the reception the fandom actually embraced it instead of actually calling it out. So it shows how I think very progressive the fandom has been with just mascots and how creative we have been, the color coding with the Babscon and the uh, Veronicon mascots, the uh, different unique takes, like Marina being a an orca yeah. movie is Mar fantastic. I, th so I think, stuff. just a quick an anecdote, I know you've probably heard this many times already, but when, when Marina was being designed, uh, the people designed them were like, we want to find some sort of local like fish or something that lives in Puget Sound. And the way Bunny described it was like, yeah, so we tried doing that. We looked up a bunch of Puget Sound fish, but the problem is they were all really, really ugly. So, so we're like, why don't we do an orca instead? That's the truth. <laughs> I think Marina's a great Boy. character.
The funny thing too is when we did the Sea Pony theme that one year, and then it was right before the G4 movie was going to come out, and we kind of got a letter saying like, "Hey, tread lightly." <laughs> So, yeah, mascots are great, I love them. Uh, yeah, go Team Marina. Thank you very much, and I think that wraps up our panels. We're very sorry we can't get to any more questions. Yeah, well, you can come talk to us afterwards. Yeah. Thank you everybody for coming.